Okay, very good morning guys. It is Wednesday the 25th of March. Hope you're doing well. I'm just going to have a, a look at this to start with. This is a heat map of the S&P 500. So rather than always be here every morning telling you about the doom and gloom, I thought I'd bring you a bit of green and a bit of positivity uh, on this Wednesday morning. So as you can see here, uh, quite a spectacular move really yesterday. And as we'll look in the Dow, uh, in, you know, we're talking about a nearly 100 year biggest move that we've seen in that in stock index. So yesterday, obviously, Apple you know, gains of 10 percent. And I was looking at some of the energy majors. Chevron's shares were up 23 percent. Um, Microsoft nearly 10 percent. So, yeah, quite incredible moves. And when we look over at the, uh, the likes of the Dow, uh, the Dow actually gained from a points perspective, yeah, over 2,100 points, and that would have been uh, a gain in excess of 11%, uh, the biggest since 1933. Uh, as you can see here, this this access on the bottom going all the way back to that, that data point of when we were, I guess, the, the depths of the, the Great Depression and the, the ensuing volatility that we saw there. Uh, and you can see, despite the, the 1987 kind of crash that we had on Black Monday, uh, Xing that out, you can see we're right on the extremities of the overall outlying uh, areas of volatility that we've had most recently. Uh, as a statistic, the Dow has swung an average of 7% since the 12th of March. I mean, it's quite phenomenal, um, the, the, the level of volatility that we have had. But overall, I would say what has been quite apparent over the last a uh, day or two is the, the violent nature of the blips and the swings. Sure, there was a little pop when the Fed made that new uh, kind of policy announcement two days ago. But otherwise, I think from comparative to the, say, two weeks ago, a week and a half ago, when it was really flying around, I think things have calmed slightly. So perhaps this combination then of, of what central banks have done and this kind of whatever it takes coordination with the governments uh, paying some dividend, you could say. Uh, but certainly that was the key story underlying, we'll, we'll talk about that more, the US fiscal package uh, that's said to be over the line now, and that's going to be key as well because it's a it's a real uh, quite unprecedented, unprecedented in terms of the size of the deal. Uh, and this is one of the things I was looking at. Um, this was, you know, if you want to take a look at this, this is just a statistics pulled from whenever the Dow has gained more than 10 percent what happens next you know this is a common question that you know if you're looking at the stats in history um, it's quite interesting to look back at you know the other times we've had these types of moves i mean obviously 2008 as much as it was sizable moves to the downside there were days when there was big snapbacks higher and there was two of those occasions uh, in october of 2008 uh, otherwise, most of these are based in the 1930s, and obviously, just following the the crash that we had in '87, there was a day of bouncing back plus 10%. Uh, but you can see here the average returns one month later after a kind of a 10% plus move in the Dow typically is around a 3% loss. Over three months, four and a half percent. Over six months, 7.87%. It's not until two years later we're actually higher. So. Obviously, when you look at these types of things, I mean, for me, um, I mean, this guy is great, uh, Ryan Dietrich. Uh, I think he works for LPL Financial in, in America. Um, if he, I did reshare or retweet this that he posted last night, so if you just go on my Twitter account, uh, you'll be able to find it. Just search for my name. Um, but here, you've got to put this type of thing into context. Obviously, what the market was like, the market dynamics. Um, the kind of underlying structure of the market, the context of the monetary policy in play at that point, the valuation in terms of the overall stock market as a whole. There's a lot of considerations here. So I don't blindly think, well, look, I'm bearish because it, this, the stats tell me that the market generally goes down in the period thereafter. Uh, you can't be that simplistic, but it certainly helps, I think, add a bit of a layer of context just generally to your overall broader uh, kind of thinking. Um, you know why has the market rallied like it has? Well, this is the big one, of course, that people are looking at. This is the Trump administration. Uh, they've struck a deal with the Senate Democrats and Republicans on a historical package. We're talking, you know, more than two trillion dollars in size. So this is one of those things where I think Sam did a great 
uh, it's got a montage video tweet uh, about Trump uh, and it only goes back about four or five weeks and it was Trump saying this virus is nothing it's fake news and then he kind of ramps it up and he's gradually gone to where he is at the moment um, and you know one of the things here is this idea that they start with a, a kind of relative small package it then went up to 1.2 trillion you remember when I was doing the briefing I think it was only Friday uh, and now we're talking in excess of two trillion. And this is one of the things that we've been point, pointing out here, amplifies this idea that you know th th these governments will continue to add to this number, and it's not, it's not, I don't think, going to be that unusual. But certainly the market seeing, you could argue, a bit of a meaningful response down the fact that this is going to go through. It's looking most likely. I've got some details here just to break it down an additional level so you know what you're dealing with. The plan includes $500 billion chunk that could be used to back loans and other aid to businesses, checks of $1,200 to most Americas, most Americans, more than $350 billion for small businesses to maintain their payrolls, more expansive unemployment insurance, deferrals of taxes, and numerous other provisions according to those familiar with the, with the details. So if anything, it kind of mimics, it's very similar in a sense to what the UK uh, were doing and probably in a proportionate sense uh, from a size perspective um, the same kind of firepower is being unveiled at this point and this is what's you know so key this coordinated global effort um, to give you again a bit of context um, in the I think it was five months after uh, the financial crisis hit in 2008 President uh, Barack Obama at the time did an 800 billion dollar uh, stimulus package what Trump's talking about now is in excess of two trillion dollars. So just to put that um, again side by side, the Trump package is, you know, huge uh, in, in that sense. Um, one thing that Trump has been saying is he's been talking about Trump starts national debate on when to reopen the economy. Now the president faces a pushback. He says he wants to have the U.S. fully open for business by Easter. Now Easter is the twelfth of April is that right uh, but it's not that far off I mean we're talking about three weeks and um, I'm gonna say it now I think there's absolutely no way the US will be fully open by Easter I feel pretty confident with making that statement um, I was just having a look at the coronavirus kind of live tracker and specifically locking in on the US um, so as you can see here it really is picking up traction now yeah, in America, and particularly on the um, the areas of which we know. It's kind of Washington State in the it's got Northwest, so Seattle and then the state of Oregon, uh, California and San Fran, and then look at the East Coast in New York in, specifically. So, I think there is no way uh, he's going to be able to fully reopen America in April. Uh, I think he's probably off the mark from a time perspective at least three months probably for a full reopening like what we're seeing tentatively in Wuhan in uh, Hubei province in China on the 8th of April. Um, so for me this the, the lockdown measures things like what we've seen in other more popular cities like in New York uh, in LA for example and what we've seen now deployed in London and of course in mainland Europe I think the only way for the US to go now is getting more onerous measures put into place not the other way round, uh, um, and that that's not going to be the short-term measure either I don't think hence the reason why you're getting these monster kind of packages coming in on the the spending side to support the economy in addition to the Fed as well as we saw doing everything that they can possibly do um, so I guess the big question then um, well before I get onto the charts and talk about the big question being where the stocks go next um, you know this was one of the other things uh, this is the FT's live tracker of the trajectory of the different um, rates of which deaths tolls in certain cities are in regard to deaths doubling every day every two days three days every week this is a, a graphic we've looked at before but the one that's actually moved where the curve has gone that way uh, and the curve getting steeper generally is, is, is a negative right that means that the, the death rate is, is becoming accelerated. And what you can see here is New York. Now New York has gone from pretty much a kind of mid uh, level in terms of comparative to other areas to now one of the sharpest increases, almost death doubling every single day now. Um, that in addition to Madrid uh, having followed a similar path, 
Uh, but New York and Madrid could pass Lombardia as the worst affected sub-national regions now. And that was obviously that first initial breakout that we saw in mainland Europe, where the Italian numbers, if you go back on here on the left-hand side, are still extraordinarily high. Um, you know, some people look at the demographics of Italy, generally quite an older population. Uh, they have um, co-generational uh, habitation which is very different in terms of uh, family units living together, you know, older grandmas living with young children and so on, and that of course increases the risk then of further spreading. So Italy is a little unique in that sense, but you know, I think New York is uh, quite a worrying one here. I mean, London still, numbers are increasing, uh, but at a less rapid pace at this point. So uh, and the point being, I think Trump is doing what Trump does, He's kind of trying to spin positive lights on this. Uh, he's going to say that he brought Congress together for this, this package to bail out America. Uh, and as we're going to see at the moment, he's also trying to manage this ongoing tension with China uh, as well, which is fairly precarious on, at this point in time. With that in mind, let's just quickly jump over to China. Uh, this was something in the FT uh, this morning. Uh, and I'm not saying that this is moving markets, but it definitely helps to supplement this kind of global action that's taking place at the moment. This is China's central bank is considering deposit rate cut. Now, what they're saying is a reduction could come in the coming days, according to those familiar with the matter in the FT. Uh, lowering, lowering rates on 175 trillion yuan, that equates to around 25 trillion US dollars of household and corporate savings would boost bank margins and free up capacity for lenders uh, who are feeling the pressure generally from the, the rising of bad debt that they've been seeing given the pressure that they've been under. So to put this in a bit of context, this is what the benchmark interest rate for saving deposits looks like um, at the bottom and the old benchmark rate for, for loans is in the blue. But you can see the last time we saw a real cutting action from the PBOC. So remember when we've seen the Chinese central bank cut rates before, it's the reserve requirement ratio. So now we're talking more specifically about other measures. So the benchmark deposit rate, which would be slightly different. Now this is kind of their main core rates, if you like. Uh, and here, 2014, 2015, you'll remember, this is when you know oil prices saw that quite catastrophic downward move uh, the whole global economy we saw that was when we one of the memorable moments when we were hitting limit down in u.s indices back in that period because of the fears of a chinese hard landing so that's when they took multiple steps to lower rates quite aggressively and they haven't really done that at all uh, since then so if they do cut rates in the coming days as is now broadly expected it's going to be the first time that they've done that since 2015 uh, so again uh, further measures that they're they're looking to deploy at this point the other thing that they're saying here was talking about uh, the White House's top trade advisor, Navarro, he was talking and quoted in the, the press this morning, uh, was said to be considering a three-month deferral of tariff payments on imported goods to ease the pain of the economic shutdown caused by the pandemic. Now, he has since come out and basically denied this. Um, as, as, as what it's saying, he's denying it, uh, these press reports, but more often than not, there's no smoke without fire, and probably this is up for discussion. Um, interestingly, in combination with this, Trump came out yesterday and he said he's no longer going to call it a Chinese virus. Uh, he's not been as forthcoming saying he was wrong. He was saying, well, that's what it is. It did come from there, but I'm not going to use that word anymore. And he was tweeting yesterday saying about how he supports American-born Chinese and so on. So he's definitely, you know, this is one of the things. It's kind of like the Easter promise that he makes. He says something and then he flips it. And, you know, the, the problem that you have is this kind of boy who cried wolf means that it's a twofold thing. One, a positive, he can change then and pivot his view and people can deal with that because it's quite normal. But the other thing is, is that if he keeps doing it again and again and again and again, when does it come to a point where people just don't believe what he's saying anymore? The problem you have, I guess, with the latter is he is delivering the Fed of cut rates to zero and the, um, the US Congress has now signed off on a north of $2 trillion package. Now, again, I'm not here to sound like I'm some sort of Trump fanatic, but just thinking through the, uh, the way that this is evolving, um, I think it's one of those where you know, he kind of muddles his way through, but relatively unscathed in, in some senses. 
Um, so yeah, I mean that's that's pretty much getting you up to date with the main headlines for today. Um, one thing that you probably would have noticed earlier this morning is that the UK data, I've just got the, the calendar here, UK data has already come out. Now obviously data normally comes out at 9.30. Uh, I've been on the phone and I've already called the, the guys at uh, New Squawk to ask them, the analyst desk, about what the deal is with this. Uh, they said that uh, it is a permanent feature um, I'm not sure of that myself, so I will need to qualify that statement. But UK data obviously is normally 9.30. I can understand logic, probably, if they did move it to 7 a.m., just looking to avert probably an uh, excessive market volatility, perhaps, when everyone's in the marketplace dropping in earlier, pre kind of generally round market open. Uh, perhaps that's the strategy there. Uh, but here we had the inflation metrics coming out of the UK. Uh, and it came in at year on year 1.7% in line, the month on month 0.4 above the expected 0.3. Uh, the core reading on the CPI came in at 1.7 above the expected 1.5 and 0.6 above the expected 0.4 on the month on month core. Uh, again, these are February readings, so quite frankly, if you look at the sterling chart, it hasn't even blinked, and quite rightly so. This is backward-looking data, and I really don't think it carries any significance at all, because also we know the stance of the Bank of England as well, and they're thinking very much so about the future. This is all backward-looking data. So uh, that has come out early. Some of the other things they were talking about, the analysts, when I was saying this morning about why this might have come out early is ONS leak, and so they wanted to just get it out there before potentially then it does start to circulate. That has I have seen that before over the years. Um, if they're aware of this uh, for whatever reason, they can just uh, bring forward the actual release time. And the other thing is that they uh, apparently just removed the lockup now. Uh, you probably would have read in the press there was a lot of issues about um, unauthorized accredited news agencies getting access to certain feeds at the, at the central bank and so on. So perhaps they're going through a bit of a restructuring process and might make sense because now Andrew Bailey's there, Carney is left and maybe a review of these processes. But overall I wouldn't read too much into it. Net net doesn't really matter this data today for any sterling uh, strategies that you're thinking of. Here then, what else have we got? We've got the German IFO business climate. Um, obviously going to be quite interesting. We're looking for a, a meaningful shift to the downside, as you would expect, given that this is uh, companies on the ground level in Germany. What they think about current and future expectations, they're going to have deteriorated quite substantially, as you would imagine. Yesterday, we had the US manufacturing service uh, numbers coming out for March and they were that they fell the most on record this is something being felt as well across the Eurozone of which we saw in those flash readings and so uh, if business sentiment is going to be depressed in in Europe or in Germany in this case I don't think that's again too much of a surprise uh, to be quite frank um, otherwise we've got the oil infantries a bit later um, they'll be coming out at 2.30. Remember, the, U the UK clocks don't change till this afternoon. Uh, if you ever did want to see what those API numbers were, I can just bring them up for you now, just so we can see it together. Zero Hedge is actually the best place. Zero Hedge, if you're not familiar with the markets, is kind of a quite infamous blog site um, where it gets a lot of traffic day to day, especially from intraday traders. They tend to be a little bit sensationalist but they do put out some, some decent stats and bank commentary and so on, which can be quite useful. So here's the numbers from last night, just so I can share them with you. You had a crude drawdown of one and a quarter million. Let's bring them up here. That was against expectations of two and a half million. Cushing was a build of a million. Gasoline a draw 2.6 million broadly in line. Still it's a draw of 1.9 million broadly in line. Uh, so let's have a look at the actual charts then uh, and talk through a few things. For one, oil um, here, you can see, go back to around when the data came out, no real way, too much in the way of response, as you would expect. I mean, from the oil market, there's so much other things going on at the moment uh, in regard to the ongoing price battle between Saudi and Russia, uh, obviously the, the growth implications from the pandemic. Uh, I still feel, I still feel fairly uh, bearish with crude to be quite frank I know we've had a, a decent rally over the last two days or so coming off in that lower bound test of close to 20 bucks where we got to the that point uh, on the 18th we kind of retested it right at the beginning of the week at the reopening of trade but ever since then we've kind of managed to claw back some losses but we've come up to this 
this area now here of the high that we had uh, yesterday we've retested that in the Asia Pacific session that has held uh, and I think that's a decent level of resistance to keep an eye on for today's session you can see the R1 in the futures resides just above that point uh, so if anything I'd still be looking to play that market back down today if I was having a, a kind of a directional bias for the equity markets I'm gonna have a look at the S&P and also um, we'll have a look at the Dow and then and the Nasdaq now the S&P here has seen uh, a decent rise this this ellipse here you can see with that big green candle that was when the Fed uh, conducted that surprise announcement um, on Monday at the beginning of the week we then reversed that but ever since that point came back to retest the overnight uh, weekly low before then moving higher and we've kind of respected here this trend line uh, on a couple of occasions uh, just being here and here for the for the move higher I was also looking at this trend line here but it's already really gone through that this morning uh, see how it responds here as it's pulled off those initial highs so you can see as we broke higher through that trend line an initial push up to yesterday's high point and then we've had a bit of an about turn here um, a lot of people asking me about you know this whole dead cat bounce um, it's come up quite quite aggressively decent move particularly on a day like yesterday and whenever you do get a 10 11 percent day um, generally speaking it does make me feel like the market is fairly susceptible for a bit of a pullback if I'm quite honest uh, because uh, the nature of the unless there's a new fundamental catalyst to just bump us up again which there hasn't been because the news what we've been talking about is all things from yesterday that created that initial price movement I do think perhaps uh, a little bit of a pullback uh, could be warranted at this point if we did get that then perhaps if we come back down there's a couple of different areas that I'd generally be looking at, um, but really the, the lower bound level, I think, as a, as a target here, if I just remove this, would be around here, really. Uh, so if we come back down, perhaps this level, that high that we had uh, on Monday in the afternoon, you can see we respected it a couple times before, and if it comes in around the trend line on the timing, uh, that could be somewhere to keep an eye on. So if I just put a rectangle, Kind of looking around this area or if we push further down here to encapsulate that initial fed spike high uh, and the bounce off that trend line that we had in the overnight asia pacific session um, just having a look elsewhere at some of the other stock indices let's get the let's get the dow into play i think there's some key levels here as well to, to keep an eye on um, if you're looking looking on a slightly longer time frame here on a 120 candlestick so you can see a similar thing it's had a bit of a breakout uh, just a short while ago as we've got above the overnight high and yesterday's high uh, and so that pushed us up to the high that we had on the 17th uh, but again it's kind of similar you've got that 17th high and the r1 sat just above and if we look at the nasdaq hasn't yet really had a concrete break of that same kind of setup slightly different uh, in a sense that it is holding for the moment um, but given the fact now the S&P and the Dow have turned slightly uh, I'd expect that to hold for the moment but certainly it's going to be more meaningful to watch when we get into uh, the North American session in a few hours time uh, cable just a quick look um, we've, we've been moving higher fairly aggressively ever since the Fed made that announcement obviously the dollar got hit uh, on the back of the extraordinary lengths that the Fed are going to to, to promote and support um, all levels of business really um, and as we've gone higher cable has been continuing to just claw back some of these levels of which have been in focus ever since really the if I just move this up uh, this tells the story of cable over the last three four years really and this incorporating then the EU referendum level and as we come back up I mean we're trading still about 170 pips away from it at the moment but given the daily ranges that we trade at the moment obviously the big upside resistance level will be the 120 that was the key level that really gave way about a week ago or so and led to this big run down that we had uh, quite quickly you remember it was the lowest we've traded since 1985 when we've got down to these lows and that big day came a multiple point move um, and so we're seeing just a bit of a bounce and I'd say perhaps it can continue but would be expecting whether today or in the coming days this week for the market to find some resistance up and around that level all right um, that is it for the time being a um, couple of final points if you are watching this and you've got this far in the briefing 
then obviously please do um, follow us on YouTube, just hit the subscribe button, click the notification bell to get the alerts for every day when we go uh, and we deliver these, these broadcasts. Uh, and then do check out the website AmplifyTrading.com if you're interested in finding out more about what we do, whether on the trading arm or if you're a student uh, and you're looking for further for kind of training to develop your, your prospects for your career. All right, that's it, guys. Have a good day and I'll see you tomorrow.